Good, good morning, everyone. Have you ever asked yourself the question, my credit scores are preventing me from qualifying for a loan? I need to repair my credit, but I don't know how. I don't understand credit scoring. Well, if you've ever asked yourself those questions or any other questions about credit, I'd like to introduce you to Evan Palmer. Evan is improving your credit profile. He says it's one of the best decisions a person can make, but figuring out how to do it can be extremely confusing and time consuming. Credit scoring is a complicated and not easily understood. In addition, it can be an emotional topic to many people and thus requires patience and sensitivity. Evan works with people to help them understand the process of credit restoration and focuses on the areas that will yield the greatest results. And I know the effort it takes to attempt to remove negative items from a credit report. Some of the things that Evan specializes in is making the credit restoration process understandable, identifying the key items holding back a credit score, devising a game plan for credit improvement, steering clear of potential landmines, looking out for overall well-being of his clients. In his free time, Mr. Palmer performs in the Maroon Band Key Lime Pie, excuse me, and then through um, the San Rafael Oaks Club with his band, Mr. Palmer full founded the Festival for Few Food, an annual fundraising event in the San Francisco Marin Food Bank. He takes place on Sunday before Memorial Day weekend and raises thousands of dollars each year with the goal of feeding as many people as possible. It's my pleasure to introduce Evan Palmer. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it and uh, great to see so many people up at this challenging hour of the day for me. <laughs> I was talking to Craig the other night and I am a night owl. So if this were happening at uh, 11 p.m., I would be on top of my game. So <laughs> I will do my best for you. But uh, as Craig said, um, I have a company called Bay Credit Restore and we do help people improve their credit scores so that they can get the loans they need at the very best interest rates. And it is a, a complicated process, uh, but there's a lot that people can do for themselves. And that's what I wanna talk about. Today, I've prepared a short presentation, relatively short, just to get into the nuts and bolts of credit scoring. And I wanna leave a lot of time for questions and answers, because I think that that's where the meat of these events is, at least for, for my presentations, it seems like all of the great stuff um, people bring up, and it would be stuff that I would probably either gloss over or just felt like I didn't have time to address, and I want to leave that time for you. So without further ado, let's, let's start by playing a game, and this is one that you can play with your mics muted. It's an audience participation game, and it's really easy to play. All you have to do is raise your hand. And the rules are that everybody has to play. So if you're on, just put your hand up because I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. For those of you who know your credit score, keep your hand up. All right, for those of you still with your hand up, if you know whether that score is an experience score, an Equifax score or a TransUnion score, you can keep your hand up. Otherwise, put your hand down. If you know whether that score is a FICO score or a Vantage score, you can leave your hand up, otherwise put your hand down. If you know whether that is a FICO 95, a Beacon Classic, a FICO 8, FICO 9, Vantage 1.0, Vantage 2.0, Vantage 3.0, leave your hand up, otherwise put your hand down. Wait, let me look. Does anybody still have their hand up? I have more. <laughs> All right, in the interest of time, <laughs> there are additional models as well. If you, if you knew all that, I would ask you, do you know whether it's a credit optics model or a national equivalency score? And there are more, uh, more models to the credit scores. Now, if you'll notice, I put my hand down right away because I haven't had my credit report pulled today. And a score is derived from what's in your credit report. And it is only generated when a report is pulled. So if you have not had your, your credit report pulled today, you actually don't even have a score. So it gets, it gets very complicated. And therein lies the, uh, the big 
the big reveal is that you don't have a score. You have dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of credit scores. Uh, in fact, you could go into the same bank on the same day and have your credit report pulled two different times from the same bureau and wind up with two different credit scores because one could be a consumer weighted model and the other could be an auto weighted model. So what do we do with all this confusion? And here's, here's the wonderful answer. Forget about the score. In the same way that you would look at the weight on a scale, if you stood on a scale and looked at your weight and you thought that that number might be a little bit high, what could you do about it? Well, you can't do much by just looking at the number and you can't reach down and change it. What you do is you go to work on the things that affect that weight. Eat better, exercise, get proper rest, proper hydration. And in the same way, if you want to improve your credit score, you go to work on the ingredients that go into making up that score. And there are five, and I just want to touch on them quickly right now. So this is how we deal with <laughs> the whole thing. And just for simplicity, I'm going to stick to a, a FICO scoring model. I work primarily with home buyers, and the mortgage industry uses FICO scoring almost exclusively. Vantage score is very similar. The splits are just a little bit different, but they have the same ingredients. So let's review this. Now, <clears throat> the common FICO scores range from a low of 300 to a high of 850. If you subtract 300 from 850, that leaves 550 points that are in play that can, that can be had, if you will. And obviously, you want to get them all. In a perfect world, that's what you want. You want a perfect score. So here's how those points break down. First ingredient of a credit score is payment history. Now, I used to think that I had perfect credit because I paid my bills on time. And truth be told, paying your bills on time is important. But would you care to guess how much FICO puts weight on that element? Just in your mind, think about, hmm, what, what could that be? Would you be surprised to know that it's only worth 35% of your score? I thought it would be more, <laughs> but 35%, remember we've got 550 points in play. 35% of that is about 192 points. And that is a lot of points. So you wanna get as many of those points as possible. And the way to do that, just pay your bills on time. It's, pretty, it's, it's a pretty straightforward process. Don't let yourself have a late payment. Do whatever you have to do, auto pay, set timers, clip art, whatever, whatever it takes, post-it notes, uh, just make your payments on time and you'll be well on your way to getting all of those points. <clears throat> now, the second area of, of scoring is what's called indebtedness. Uh, <clears throat> and it's worth about 30% of the score. And this is, this is, um, this is the area that you can make the most gains with a score. <clears throat> Debt utilization is a ratio. And it specifically talks about credit card debt. Now, a lot of people are carrying some kind of debt on their credit cards. And that could be debt that you're going to pay off at the end of the month with no penalty. Um, or it could be debt that you carry from month to month uh, whittling it down as time goes on. Doesn't matter. It's specific to that. And debt utilization is just a fancy way of saying, how maxed out are my credit cards? And it's a ratio. It's how much you owe divided by the credit limit. And it's cumulative. So you add all of the, the uh, balances on your credit cards and you divide it by the sum of all of your credit limits. So an example, if you had two credit cards, and one of them was a Visa card, and you owed $4,000 on the Visa card, and you had a Macy's card, and you owed $1,000 on the Macy's card. You would add 4,000 and 1,000 together. You owe a total of $5,000.
if the limit on your visa card is $9,000 and the limit on your Macy's card is $1,000, add those together, nine plus one, $10,000. So the, the ratio, 5,000 that you owe divided by 10,000 credit limit is 50%. And then the next logical question is, is 50% good? And the answer is, not really. <laughs> Remember, this, this area is worth 30% of your score. That translates into about 165 points. 50%, you might surmise, I'm only going to get half of those points. Now, it's, it's a lot more complicated than that, but just ballpark, you can kind of go with this process. So I know we see, when, whenever you see a, a question about how much is, should my debt utilization be, you often see the number 30 tossed around 30%. I have no idea why. 30% is better than 35%, but not as good as 25%. To get all the points, you, you need your debt utilization to be zero or 1%. But if that's a, a little bit of a far ways to target, you know, if you're starting at 50 and you're thinking, well, I got to get this down to zero or one, uh, it, it's not, it may not be that motivating. Why not seven? Use 7% as a target. Why? Because that's where, that's the number that is, <laughs> is the debt utilization for the people who have the highest credit scores in the country. All right. So debt utilization, again, very important because it is, if, you've, if you're carrying credit card debt, paying down that debt is, is the way to increase your score the fastest. Okay. Third area of point scoring is age of file. And age of file has two components. It's the age of your oldest account and the average age of all of your accounts. So remember, when it comes to credit scoring, old is good. You'll want stuff that's old on your report because it shows that you have history borrowing and repaying loans. And that's what it's all about. That's what the score is all about, is evaluating risk. Can you borrow stuff and pay it back? And so age of file comes in in those two areas. And of course, you would think that, you know, somebody who's lived a little bit is going to have a more, more of an advantage score wise over somebody who's just starting out, somebody getting out of high school or college and just starting their credit profile. Now, age of file is worth 15% of the score or about 82 points. So it is very significant. And here's, here's the thing. This is why we say never close an open credit card? Well, there's a couple reasons. But one of them is that now closed accounts do stay on your credit report. Uh, closed accounts in good, positive condition, <laughs> let's say, uh, will stay on your credit report about 10 years before they drop off. Negative items, there's a, there's a lot of, of uh, nuance to negative items, but the rule of thumb about seven years before they drop off, before that negative drops off. But let's go back to the positive item. Let's say that you had a mortgage that you paid for 30 years and you paid it off. Okay, so that's gonna stay on, on your report another 10 years. Well, maybe it's one of the older items that you have on your credit report. When that drops off, you may lose one of your oldest accounts and you're certainly going to experience an increase in the age of file. And this is one of the not so great things about uh, the aftermath of, of paying off property. I would always advise to do that. But uh, when it comes to credit scoring, it's, you have to understand that there is a downside to the score because of age of file. So there's that. All right, let's move on to number four, the fourth out of our five areas of scoring inquiries. So this is when you're applying for credit. Now, there are two types of inquiries. There are hard inquiries and there are soft inquiries. So a hard inquiry is if you're applying for a loan, you're asking for money, you can be sure that that's going to be a hard inquiry. And it's going to cost you a handful of points. The, uh, the good news is, is, is it only costs you points for the first year. And then it'll drop off the report altogether after two years. 
The other, the other, the soft inquiry, that's if you're checking on your own credit. And that is, that doesn't cost you anything at all. And we advise that absolutely you should be checking your own credit and making sure. It also applies to other things like insurance, um, job applications, these various industries that do check credit as part of their standard operating procedures. Those are also considered soft, in, uh, soft inquiries and they don't take points away from you. So uh, inquiries, 10% of your score or about 55 points. So the, the rule of thumb, keep your inquiries to a minimum and spread them out over a long period of time. All right, fifth area and final area is called mix of credit. Now, in baseball, I, I'm sure we've got some baseball fans out there. A player who can hit for average, hit for power, run fast, throw accurately, and defend well is called a five-tool player. And in the same way, mix of credit gives extra credit <laughs> to people who are five-tool players of their credit report. In other words, they're demonstrating that they can repay loans of, of a different nature, of different natures, such as revolving loans, credit cards, installment loans, like car payments, mortgage loans, house payments. So if you've got a mix of different kinds of credit, they give you extra points. And how many extra points? This is 10% of the score, 55 points. So those are the ingredients. And the idea is if you can make each one of those ingredients look as good as you possibly can, your score is going to be positively influenced. And there you have it. <laughs> There's understanding your credit. Uh, there are a lot of things that people can do for themselves. And to that end, I actually, um, I, I do a, an ongoing um, Q&A, essentially. Uh, I call it the credit minute. And it's, uh, it's something I record short videos just answering questions. And I thought, you know, why not put all of these, because I've been doing it for a couple of years, why not put all of these into a book? So I just completed writing a book called Growing Great Credit. And at some point, it will become a physical product. Right now, it's just a PDF. And I do, as you know, as a gift to you all, I want to make it available to you, no charge. And Craig is, is going to somehow you know, be the point person. He has a copy of it, and he can distribute it to you as, as he will. Anybody that's interested can, uh, can take a read. So with that, that concludes my prepared remarks for today. And I would like to open this up to questions because I, and let's, let's take it. We can go off on any tangent you want to. Uh, I'm happy to do that. And I have no other plans this morning. So I will be here until uh, we're all taken care of. Hey, Evan, thanks. You know, that was, that was fantastic. Um, and I, I, let me start it out with a question of my own. And then, um, you know, you guys can, I'll be looking at the screen, just raise your hand. Um, or if you want to put a question in the chat, we can do that. Um, and also, um, I want to add a few things. Evan had mentioned the, uh, the book, the PDF. So if you're interested in that, uh, let me know and I can get a copy emailed to you. And also what I'll do is I'll include a link to the credit minute. You know, I think that you've got that on LinkedIn, right? Right. It's a, it's an ongoing, uh, ongoing posts that I, I yeah. put up. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, I, LinkedIn is a great resource and um, I actually, I'm on your distribution list. So when a new one pops up, I always see it. And, uh, you know, Evan, you can see he's an entertaining guy and he has good things to say in his credit minute. Well, it's really not a minute. It's usually like three or four minutes, it's, but yeah, it's more like two, but the credit two minute doesn't really have a ring to it. <laughs> yeah. But it's actually a good two minutes of your day because, you know, it, it you, you learn a lot and it reminds you of maybe best practices and, and how to you know maintain your credit score. So my question is this, um, you were talking about, uh, things dropping off after 10 years and you have a loan for a house. Um, what about refinancing? Does that reset the clock or does that, um, does the original loan kind of seed that? Well, each, each time you take out a new loan, it creates a new account, right? And, and on uh, the industry speak on that is it on a credit report, they are called trade lines. So I, 
I don't know the derivation of that, but that's the that's the reality of it. So whether you have a a Visa card or a Wells Fargo home loan or a Kia auto payment, they're all called trade lines. <laughs> and so every time you open a new one, so if it's a refi, generally that's a new that generates a new account number. It would create a new trade line. And does that affect you negatively or positively, or does it really matter? Well, it really depends on, on the um, repayment habits. So right. um, if, an, if an account is closed, then you, know, you fall into that category of it's going to stay open for, it'll stay, it'll, if the account's closed, it'll stay on the report for about 10 years if it's, in, uh, if it's a positive looking account, if you've made all your payments on time and there's no negatives to it. Okay. Um, I saw Claudette has her hand up and then Janice Lipman will follow Claudette. Hi, Claudette. I, I have a couple of questions. One, I refied recently uh, with um, Rocket and they checked my credit three times during the refi. And I got dinged three times because it was a credit check. Uh, and it was for the same refi, which was approved, but... Mm -hmm. But that's, that's very hurtful, correct? I mean, how do you handle that? Credit scoring models are becoming more predictive every year, right? They're all about predicting risk. That's, that's what they're getting at. And they are constantly trying to revise, you know, how can we better approximate whether this person is going to, is going to be late on payments going forward. And to that end, um, they actually have progressed to the point where they will treat multiple, and this is from a scoring perspective, they will treat multiple inquiries within a certain time frame, as long as they're, you know, within a couple of different industries as one. So let's give you an example. The one that you just described, if they inquired three times within, and, and I believe that the number right now is 45 days. Yeah. If they believe if they inquired three times, yes, it will show up as three separate inquiries. However, from a scoring model, they will treat that as one inquiry because they know it's a it's a mortgage loan. They assume that you're just buying one house, not three houses. Now, on the flip side, if you were if you had three inquiries for different visa cards, no. That's, that's not going to fly. That's going to be three hard inquiries and those are each going to cost you a handful of points. My second question is that I have, I own some properties and I have mortgages on them. Some people tell me to have several mortgages is a bad thing. And, and I'm trying to figure out based on your five points, if it really is. As long as you're, as long as you have a positive repayment history, mm -hmm. It's, it's great. And actually, the argument could be made that when one of them becomes paid off, you know, all of your uh, credit mix is not going to be tied to that one account. So if it drops off, you'll probably have another one that's still active and, and, uh, and it will, it'll help you. Um, in general, and, and I've answered this question for other people, uh, mostly in regards to credit cards is like, is there a, is there a maximum number? There really isn't. There really isn't. It's a, uh, there is a minimum. If you don't have any open credit, that's a big problem because uh, what's a lender going to use to approximate your risk of repaying that loan? They, and so you're going to, and that's why the, the scoring is, is geared that way. Um, if you don't have any open credit cards, and I'm going to go off on a tangent here a little bit because this is important. Um, I see a lot of people who are at various stages of their lives, either just starting out, or maybe they've had uh, some event happen, uh, whatever it is, and they're down to either zero or one credit card. Um, and that's fine. And, and by the way, just so that you know, just so <laughs> totally upfront about this, I am not an advocate of carrying debt. Um, I think if you don't have any debt, you're winning. However, when it comes to credit scoring, it's, it's if you're in that camp and you think, well, why do I need a credit score? Maybe you don't, you know? Um, if you're not gonna borrow anything ever for the rest of your life, 
who cares? <laughs> right? You're winning. <laughs> However, if you think you might at some point need to go get a loan or you want to reserve that option, well, you best be thinking about how does my credit report, how does my credit score look? And remember, it's all about borrowing and repaying. That's, that's, that's what it is. It's a game. Yeah, it, it, scoring is a game and you just have to figure out how to play the game to get the results that you want. So to continue down this tangent, for people that don't have a bunch of credit cards and they're down to zero or one, what does that do to your ratio, your indebtedness ratio that, that uh, how much you borrowed over how much yeah, you got zero. And so remember, how many points are we talking about? We're talking about 165 points and you're getting none of them. And you can imagine on a perfect score of 850, if you took 165 points off the board, it has a huge impact, you know? And that's just for not playing the game of, of uh, indebtedness, you know, that, that, second, that second one. And, and that's, you know, that's... Um, that's why I don't like using that that word. Although we see different terms for these different categories, and it's it's you know try not to get hung up on don't get hung up on the scores, don't get hung up on the terms. They are what they are, regardless of what you call them. It's that ratio of what you owe versus what you have the capability of borrowing, the credit limit. Thank so you, you got to have some cards in play. Thank you. Uh, Janice, you're up next. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you hey, so Janice. much. Hi, good morning, Evan. Thank you so much. Uh, the big credit that I, uh, the big question that I assume people are wondering and I'm wondering is how you, how you get something that's negative or erroneous off your report. Right. The important, well, and here's the thing. Um, there are consumer protection laws in place right now, the cornerstone of which is the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And in that act, it states that if an item is inaccurate, outdated, or unverifiable, then it needs to be deleted. And it should come as no surprise that it's on you to bring that to somebody's attention. <laughs> <laughs> there actually is, if you dig deep enough into the machine, there actually is an incentive for people to be seen as having low scores. But that's, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole right now unless you really, really want to. <laughs> but getting back to, um, you know, getting back to it, it's, um, it, you know, it's, it's complicated. But here's the thing. If you've got an inaccuracy, Let's say that, uh, well, it doesn't matter. It, whatever it is, it's, that's not correct. The proper way to do this is to draft a letter. And I know this sounds arcane, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this in a minute. But you draft a letter, and you send it to one of the three, or all of the three, depending on who's reporting it. Not every account is reported to every credit reporting bureau. There's no law that says that it has to. So you might find some reported to TransUnion, some reported to all three, TransUnion, Experian, and, and Equifax. Now there are other, uh, there are other um, consumer reporting bureaus um, or consumer reporting agency is the proper term, CRAs, uh, such as Innovus, but they haven't risen to the level of the big three. So we always kind of focus on Equifax, Experian, and and um, TransUnion. So if you've got something that's reporting inaccurately to TransUnion, you write them a letter and you say, I, I don't think that this is right. Uh, here's what it should be. If you've got any proof, enclose that as well. And you have to enclose proof of the fact that you are the person who owns this account. So they wanna see three pieces of identification. Um, yeah, if, you, if you're current, address is on your driver's license, that can become 
two pieces of that, that ID package because they want to see a photo ID. They want to see a proof of your address and they want to see a proof of your social security number. So that could be something like a social security card. It could be the front page of a tax return. It could be a W-2 statement, something that has your name associated with your social security number. So those are the three pieces of ID that you need to send in. Otherwise, it won't get considered. It'll get kicked out as frivolous. They would do like nothing to do than just throw your request in the trash. It costs them time and money. So they can't, and they really can't be bothered. That's their attitude. So they're, they're actually not really in the credit scoring business. They're in the data business. Uh, this just happens to be an ancillary product of theirs. Uh, the other thing, and sometimes highly more effective, is if you have, and this, this happens a lot with late payments. Late payments are awful to deal with because they're, they're you know, it's by the time you're 30 days late, you know, you, you don't really have much of an argument, except sometimes um, snafus happen. And one common thing that causes people to be late is if something happens with their auto payment. Um, I see this a lot. And if you can prove that that happened, then you obviously have an excellent uh, excuse for getting that removed. Um, but in this case, uh, so, and, and in the case, uh, a lot of times it does come down to, to late payments and such, but you can also go directly to the lender and have a conversation with them, try to get past the 1-800 uh, the desk and get to somebody that actually has some power, a supervisor, a manager, or somebody, and you know, get, their, get their name because you want to put everything in writing, of course, uh, and explain your situation with them. And if you, your goal being you'd like to get something in writing back from them, whether it's an email, um, whether it's a letter that's from that lender, which then you can take and send that extra weight to the uh, credit reporting bureau. So that's how you do it. Now, the reason you do it through the mail and you don't do it online is because you give up certain rights online. And in fact, Craig, this is my last credit minute that I think I just put out on Monday. Um, don't dispute online. This is, this is really important because we're all, you know, this is the 21st century, we're all doing stuff as quickly as possible, online as possible. And if you go to a site like Experience, um, it's like, okay, how do I dispute? There it is. You click the button, you fill out your stuff, da 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 da. You th think this is the way to do it. Mistake. Reason being, the Fair Credit Reporting Act gives you rights, right? We talked about that. There are several that are extremely important. Um, and one of them is that you're allowed to request a method of verification from the um, from the credit reporting bureau how did you get this information another is that if they if they delete the um, the account that and then later reinsert it they have to tell you that they're going to reinsert it on on uh, the credit report and most importantly if you were to, to um, challenge an account with, let's say, Experian, Experian has to go to the original creditor and ask them about the status of, the, of this account. And then they report it back and they report it to you. Now, in a crazy twist of fate, the Fair Credit Reporting Act says that if you request stuff online, if you dispute things online, none of those rights that I just mentioned apply to you. And there are more, but you can't be given up rights. And, and I don't know why it's that way. It doesn't make any sense at all, but I'm sure you could find other things in this crazy world that don't make any sense at all. And that's just the way they are. And this falls into that category. So it's really important that look up the address, send in mail. And these days, everything is running so crazy and weird. I recommend, and, and I'm doing this with all my clients, we send everything certified return receipt. Yes, it adds about five dollars and eighty cents or something to the to the the mailer, but it holds their feet to the fire. They have thirty days to respond to you. That's part of the FCRA as well. And if you know when that item was received, the clock's ticking. 
Otherwise, it can just be conveniently lost in the mail. And believe me, that's happening all the time. All right, excellent. Um, Tony, you have a question and I see Bert has his hand up. So go ahead, Tony. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Evan, I was curious, is there a way we can check our credit report from the different credit bureaus without causing a bad inquiry on that credit report? Yes. Excellent question. Um, well, first of all, if you're checking your own cre credit, it's not going to it's not going to cost you any points. But there are a couple of great ways to check on your own credit. And right now, actually, because of the CARES Act that came out with this pandemic, um, it even got easier. So one of the ways that I recommend is to go to annualcreditreport.com. Not to be confused with free credit report, annualcreditreport.com is a, it, it, that is the gateway to the actual reporting agencies. And for as long as I've known, um, they have been able to provide a free credit report every year, once a year to everybody so that you're more knowledgeable of what's going on. But since the CARES Act came along, it got better. Instead of just be having access to that once a year, you can actually request a new report every week. And this is gonna stay in place until April of next year, um, assuming that nothing else gets changed. And this allows you to get a report directly from the bureaus. So that's an excellent way. Now, if you want a score attached to it, it's gonna cost you more. Why? Because they outsource the scoring. And this is one of the reasons why there are so many scores, right? Scores are an ancillary product to the credit report. So uh, <clears throat> totally separate worlds that, that they, and they come together in, in a lot of the reports. But to, if you're going to actually look at what's going on, remember, I don't get too hung up on the scores for the reasons I said earlier. Just look at the ingredients, look at what's wrong, look for mistakes, that's, uh, that's what I do every day is I look at credit reports and I look for stuff that's inaccurate. Um, so that's one area. You can get um, reports for, directly from annualcreditreport.com. Some of them will be, you'll be able to download right away. Some you got to fill out a form and mail it in. Regardless, you can get it for free uh, and it's a reputable source. Um, otherwise, we also recommend uh, enrolling in a credit monitoring service. The downside of that is that it does cost money. Most of them cost somewhere between $20 and $30 a month. Um, they do give you alerts, which is nice. Uh, and you can usually get some kind of scores. A lot of them use Vantage scoring, but it can give you a sense for what's going on. Um, and uh, well, I'll, let me just talk briefly about Credit Karma. Um, everybody asks about it. It's free. Um, so that's kind of cool. And um, a lot of my colleagues are really down on Credit Karma because it's not really that accurate or as accurate as you need it to be. But look, if you're, if you're working on your own credit, if you want, or you're trying to improve it, if you're, you've, got a, you've created a campaign for yourself to, to improve credit, you're not going to be looking at Credit Karma. Why? Because they're only reporting two of the three bureaus. And if something is wildly inaccurate on Experian, you'll never know about it because they don't report Experian. So, and you know, they use Vantage scoring, whatever. Um, but that's the real reason is if you're going to work on your own credit, you want uh, to have access to information from all three bureaus. In fact, you need that. So just make sure that you're getting, if they throw in the scores, cool. But again, don't get hung up on the scores. All right, excellent. Um, Bert, you had a question. Yeah, uh, a, a hey, quick Bert. one. I get, I, I get credit sc scores from my credit union and, and they just give it to me. Um, but the second question um, that I've got is I have I have extremely high uh, score, you know, nice. right at the top. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and yet every time I've applied for, and I've only got one credit card account but every time I applied for a credit card through Southwest Airlines or the airlines, they reject me right away. And I can't figure out why, because I've got, you know, I've got just about perfect credit and I've got no, no dings, everything's on time. I pay everything off every time. Any thought why that is? Do you charge a lot on that one credit card that you have? Uh, yeah. On a monthly basis? 
uh, probably, yeah, about probably fifteen, seventeen hundred dollars. Yeah, but you pay it off every month. Yep. Okay. Well, without looking at your credit report, I'm sure, and this is the one of the, one of the things that uh, that um, is a truism for me is that I never know. I, I could never know what the reason is because there, as you can probably surmise from what I've said so far, there's so many factors that go into comprising the score that uh, if you had told me that you didn't have a credit card, it'd be like, oh, ding, 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 ding. That's probably the reason right there. But, uh, and, you know, it could be something else. Um, could be something lingering there that uh, just isn't, isn't visible or I, I don't know. But let's just go with, and I'm, I'm glad that you brought this up because I was hoping somebody would, would give me the, um, the on-ramp to talk about this. This is, this, is gonna, this is gonna be a cool one. This is like inside baseball. And it's for anybody that is really actively trying to get as many points as they can right away. Let's talk about that one credit card that you have because I have one as well. I actually have three credit cards that I, I use and I, I, I make sure that I keep them active because one thing that happens when, when uh, and this is just a slight parenthesis here, one thing that happens when credit tightens, uh, you know, like, like it is this year in this crisis that we're all going through, um, lenders want to reel in how much money they're, they're making available. And a couple of things that can happen is credit limits on credit cards can be reduced they don't even have to tell you, really. I mean, <laughs> they could, but um, you may find that bal that credit limits are being reduced. The other thing is that if you haven't used a card in a year or two, they may just close it on you, and that'll cost you points. Probably, if you know, if you're in that um, that debt utilization camp, that indebtedness camp that uh, is carrying balance. And the the reality is, is that most of us are, and we don't even know it. So here's, let me get back to the, back on track. I have a card as well. Uh, my primary card is a Southwest card because I like getting the miles and I charge everything on it. I, you know, groceries, gas, whatever. And then I pay it off by the due date. My due date's the 23rd of every month. So let's just say, follow with me, if you will, this one little example. So let's say I charge $800 last month. And this month, my bill comes due for $800. And my statement date is the 10th. And on the 10th, it says I owe $800 by the 23rd. And I go ahead and I pay that off. No problem. No finance charge. We're all good. Next month, I charge $1,000. And on the statement date, that state, statement comes to me. It says I owe $1,000. And by the 23rd, I pay off $1,000. Again, all good. So I should be getting all my points, right? Wrong. What gets reported to the bureaus is the balance on the statement date. So, and the, and the reason is the bureau doesn't know whether I made any payments or made some payment or they don't know. What they do know is they know how much I owed on the statement date. And so on that statement date, the bureau thinks that I owed $800 and then I owed $1,000. Now, depending on how high my credit limit is, if it's really high, it's not gonna make that much of a difference. If it's a lower, relatively lower credit limit, it may make a big difference. If I'm borrowing, if my credit limit's $2,000 and, and I just ran up a thousand before I paid it off, that's 50%, you know, that's, that's a big point loss. You know, if my credit limit's a hundred thousand, then, you know, obviously <laughs> that's a drop in the bucket. It's not gonna make a difference. But this is where a lot of points can be gained on, in a short term play. So if you are on the hunt, for points, my recommendation is, is to pay that balance off before the statement date. Don't wait until the due date. So there you could pick up some points. Now, I don't know if that's what's going on, because again, I, I'd have to see the whole picture uh, to see what else is in play. Um, yeah, I do pay it off before the, before the due date consistently. Yeah, but the key is to pay it off before it even gets reported to you. And that would require you to call them up and there's often an automated line that says, here's your balance and to pay it off right then before they even generate a statement so that when they report it to the bureaus, they're reporting that you owe zero. Okay. Evan, I have a question for you. Um, yep. 
and then I'll go on to Betty. I saw just saw Betty's hand. Um, so okay, so I have a I have a daughter that just graduated from college. I don't think she has a credit card yet, um, but I can see the value of establishing a credit profile now. Um, oh yeah, and learn some good habits. Do you recommend using the credit cards that are offered through the bank? In this case, it would be Redwood Credit Union or would it be more beneficial to have a credit card like, you know, just a regular city bank card or something along those lines or an American Express for that matter? Yeah. Um, the key thing is, is that they're going to report. You want to make sure that whoever you get a card from, they're going to report to all three bureaus because you want to get credit for this. That's the whole point, right? You want to right. establish, you know, a profile and definitely uh, sooner than later because of that component age of file your oldest account, your oldest active account, your oldest um, closed, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if they're open or closed, but you want an old account in that mix. So 20 years from now, that, and assuming that she keeps that, that card active, it's gonna still be working for her. You know, it's, it's actually gonna be working more for her. So yeah, you wanna keep that, that open. Um, okay. Now, does it matter? It just matters that they report. And if, if you have a plan that you're going to be, uh, you know, carrying a balance, I mean, very few people do, but sometimes people use credit cards as a loan. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs do. And uh, if that's a consideration, then, of course, you're looking at, at what's the interest rate um, and what's, you know, what's the annual payment and all of that and, and making sure it's something that you can live with. But the key is, is just making sure that it reports. Um, I do like credit unions uh, a lot. Um, that's that's where I got my my first loans, credit and installments. So I have a I, I like them, <laughs> but it it really doesn't matter so much. The, the important thing is get in the game. Okay. And oh, and let me just take a let me just take a second to go off um, and and mention. And this is probably intuitive, but I'll say it anyway. Debit cards don't count because money is not being borrowed and repaid. They do not count for your credit score. And there are a lot of reasons why I prefer credit cards over debit cards, uh, but it would take a long time to explain. <laughs> I actually did a, I think it was a three part series, credit minute series on that one because uh, even two minutes wasn't enough. I needed a lot of time to, to go in, into depth on that, but uh, there's a, a lot of good reasons to use a credit card as opposed to a debit card. Um, of course, if, you know, if it does it for you, that's fine. But the key thing is fraud. Um, credit cards, there's a natural buffer built in because of the lag time between when you charge something and when it's due. You get a statement, you have time to review it. And it's like, oh, man, this isn't right. This, this, no, I, did, I would, no. I, I have time to dispute it before the, it even becomes due. Whereas on a debit card, it can, it can, that money disappears today and the bank can, can take a week or more. They'll freeze your account. And this happened to my son. I was like, don't you listen to my credit minutes? <laughs> should, why do you have a debit card? <laughs> but he's an adult. He's going to make his own decisions. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, they'll freeze your account. And then you better hope you have a credit card if you're, you know, if you're using it. Okay. We, um, Betty, you have a question. And then Ann Mahoney has a question. And I think we're going to be kind of running out of time about then. So um, I'm here as long as you want me. Uh, wait, 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 I think we have some people need to get off the call by nine. Yeah. So um, sure. Betty, go ahead. Okay, Evan, thank you for your very, for your excellent presentation and all of the information. Uh, several questions. Um, if a buyer is going to be going to different lenders to price shop and they all check when they have their application, filling out applications. So you may have three credit checks from three different lenders. Is there any way to prevent that or just tell the lender, here's my stuff, but don't do my credit check? What do you recommend for that? That's one question. Yeah, well, <clears throat> we, we touched on this earlier. Um, as long as it's within a small window of time and, okay. and it's not a credit card, which it's not. So this is about a mortgage loan. Uh, scoring has progressed to the point where it will consider multiple inquiries within, you know, for mortgages as one inquiry. 
And again, I believe that the, the, the window of time is within a 45 day period. Okay. And that, that will change, I'm sure, as time goes on. But um, that they figure that a person is not going to be buying six houses if they've got six inquiries. So uh, not a problem. Okay, they I do not assume that if it's a if it's a visa card application. They think that you're trying to borrow money all over town if you apply for six credit cards, but not in the case. And it's not the case with auto loans as, as well. Yes, they will show up on, on the report because they actually happened. Um, it is accurate, but from a scoring perspective, no. Um, and different scoring models are going to treat that differently. You know, so it's, um, is there a way to prevent it from happening? Not that I know, not unless, <laughs> not unless they, they figure out a way to get a, uh, a ballpark quote without actually anybody digging in, uh, which I don't think it's possible actually. Okay, because I thought it was just one bank with three inquiries, but it could be three. It could, no, it, it could be, awesome. yeah. And, and the best way to think about it is, is shopping for a car because nobody shops for, you know, there's not multiple inquiries with, you know, you're going to Toyota, you're going to Nissan, you're going to Ford, you're going to Sh Chevrolet they're all different and yeah that, that'll all count for one as long as it's within a certain time frame from a scoring perspective thank you the second question is with credit cards um like for example with macy's i got it for a sale and then i never use it so they actually closed my account should that be something that i try to get reinstated or get off of that or just not worry about it because i don't want all these credit cards that i'm not using anymore like how many cards have do you have <laughs> oh, I don't know. Probably Ballpark. five, six. Well, you could probably afford to, to lose one or two. But again, you have to think about it. And, and here's the thing with closing a card. It really affects two areas of those five ingredients. It, it, it affects age of file mm -hmm. and, and it affects debt utilization or indebtedness. Mm -hmm. So with age of file, and, and this is something when, when people are consolidating, this is, this is what I direct their attention to. What's your oldest card? If that Macy's card is your oldest card, well, that's that's actually helping your score. Because again, old is good. You want stuff that's old. And if you take that off, then the next oldest card becomes <laughs> uh, the next the next oldest card becomes the one that's in play as the oldest. So age of file, and, and the other thing is your average age is affected. There's two components to age of file. One is, is it the oldest or not? And the other is the average age. And this is, this is affected a couple of different ways. Uh, certainly if you have an old account, it is helping to increase the average age of the account. Now, if you close that, it's gonna decrease, it's gonna, your file just got younger. And if you add a new card, it's going to get younger still, the average age. So you can just see the points yeah. ticking off. Now, it's it's not a lot of points. And the, the whole category is 82 points approximately. So it's not huge, but it's still a factor. And 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 so that's that's one. That's age file. The other area is, is um, debt utilization. And this is where your credit limit can be helping. Now, if you're not carrying any debt among any of your credit cards, if you're zero, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you lose a card, you know, as far when it comes to, it matters for age of file, but it doesn't matter um, for debt utilization because zero is zero. Mm -hmm. and, or nothing from nothing is nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to old lyrics. Uh, <laughs> So if you, but if you are carrying a balance, yeah. then your credit limit cumulative comes into play. Mm -hmm. And if you're, you know, if you have, if you've added up all your credit cards and you've got 20,000 and, and your Macy's is gonna add another 500, well, that's not much. It's probably not gonna move the needle. But if, you know, shoe on the other foot, if you've got a bunch of credit cards that's worth a thousand, your Macy's is worth 5,000 and you're gonna drop that card, and you're carrying a balance, your mm -hmm. score is going to go down for sure. So if my last question quickly is, if you have, a, let's say, a Visa card and it's compromised and they have to give you a new account number, does that mean that other account is closed that was compromised by somebody and then you have to start your timeline new or do they yeah. just... 
Um, it, it does. But remember, closed accounts do stay on the report. Okay. So it is going to, it's going to okay. continue to help you, but yeah, uh, it's a, it's an unfortunate turn of events, you know, that, that happens that way. So you get stuff that's unfortunate that works in your favor and stuff that doesn't. So just like everything, just like life. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, and we have quite time for one more question and uh, Anne's, Anne's up next. So um, we'll close it out with Anne's question. Great questions, by the way, everyone. And if you have more questions for Evan, I've got a few I'll bring offline, but um, I'll, I just let me know and I'll make sure you have all of Evan's contact information so that you can ask him privately. Yeah, and, please uh, do not hesitate to give me a call. And, and even if you just got a, a simple question, I, I'm, I, this is, this is a big part of my job is education. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to do it. it. Thank you. Um, and go ahead and ask the last question. Craig, are you, or did you put Evan's information in the chat? Uh, I didn't, but I will send out an email to you directly. Okay. okay. And also um, I'll, I'll put a, I'll put a link to the credit minute. It's really, um, it's, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Ann. Well, a couple of things. Capital One did that to me. I had a card I hadn't used forever and ever and ever. And I get this letter that says, well, if you're not going to use it, we're going to close it. And I thought, oh, I've sort of listened to things that Evan has said. So I better go use that card to keep it open. I go to use it and they go, um, that card's not available. It's been closed. Mm. And I'm like, what? Wow. And, I, yeah. and I had it forever. So that thank you, Capital mm. One. Um, my question is what we're seeing on TV are these ads for something I've never heard of before. And I can't remember if it's Experian or Equifax and people go, I went to Equifax.com or something and I increased my credit score by 30 points, just like that. And I'm thinking, what in the heck are they talking about? So can you tell us what that is? Yeah, you talk about the purple cows? The Experian boost. Yeah, boost. boost. <laughs> yeah. I did. I did a fun credit minute on that one as well because I, I I love those ads. I just like the cows and John Senna is he's great in that role. <laughs> okay, so and so what's here, the, here's here's the bottom line. Um, actually, it's I, I can't get to the bottom line right away. Let me lead into it and then I'll give you the bottom line. Um, what what Experian is doing is they are offering a way to use your the payment of your utility bills which typically does not play in to credit scoring, traditional credit scoring, but people have utility bills and they pay them. Um, and if, if your credit is positive, so they, in an interesting twist, they don't, if it's not positive, they're not gonna report it. So it's not gonna work against you. It can only work for you. So you can imagine how a lender might feel about that probably not so good. <laughs> not an not a accurate assessment of what's going on, uh, if you ask me. But anyways, it, it gives you an opportunity as a utility um, user who pay, is paying a bill to get credit for paying on time. And it is being factored into a couple of the newer credit reports, such as FICO 8 and FICO 9. Um, and that can yeah, it can increase a score a little bit. Now, for all of you that work with home buyers, it's not going to, here's the bottom line, it's not going to matter at all because none of them use FICO 8 and FICO 9 scoring. And this is, this is, the, this is the thing that you have to keep in mind when, when uh, these conversations come up. It's like, okay, well, what scoring model does that apply to? And do any of my lenders use that scoring model? I mean, this is this is the big FICO versus Vantage score debate. It's a lot of lenders use Vantage scoring. Nothing wrong with it. Um, it's it's totally valid. Um, it's but if you're applying for a home loan, they don't care what your Vantage score is because they only use FICO. So and and to boot, they only use old versions of FICO. It's it's as if you're booting up your computer and you know, all of these great features are now available in the 21st century, but you're still using Windows 97. That's what mortgage lenders are doing. They're using old versions of scoring. Um, now, that's not the case with, with other lenders, but at the moment, that's what we're looking at. And so I have to remind people about that all the time. And they call me up and say, oh, my credit karma is 780. How come I have a 640? 
at the at the mortgage lender. It's like, well, <laughs> a lot of reasons, but one big reason is you're comparing apples to oranges. So, mm-hmm. you know, you just have to keep that in mind. Does that answer your question? Well, it looked like a, a lot of young people, and but maybe that was just you know for the TV ad. I use yeah. Boost. I use well, boost. there's a reason for that though. A lot of young people don't have the credit history. Um, that they really want. And so what's a, but what they, what they do start doing is they start making utility payments as soon as they get out on their own, Uh, whether they own a place, they rent a place, share it, whatever. Uh, And so they're looking for ways that, okay, we can get these people in the game. We can get some credit, you know, built some, some kind of history, whether it's being evaluated by everybody or not. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, we're at 901, so um, let's uh, let's give Evan a big hand here. And uh, Evan, thanks. Thanks. For I hope it was helpful. Uh, yeah. I know it's yeah. kind of a it's kind of hard to follow sometimes. That's because it's confusing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really you know I I being in the real estate business, I look at credit reports a lot, and um, but it, it's it's a fascinating part of the business, and you make it interesting and fun. So thank you for you know joining us and just. Um, enlightening us to our good and bad habits and you know hopefully we'd be more responsible credit creditors or creditees in the future so uh, thanks again evan right on. And, uh, you are so uh, welcome thank you so much for having me as it is an honor and a pleasure uh, and thank then you. It, you know go ahead if you guys need anything from me regarding evan just go ahead and shoot me an email and i'll send you an email um and again thanks again evan you guys have a great day okay thank you, thank you. Thank you.